Shall we get started? All right, I've got, ooh, <laughs> hello. Um, I have 2.30 and I'm gonna start. Um, so we as the science track have received a request from Disability Services that in order that those who need to read lips in order to understand what people are saying, uh, that panelists remove their masks while they are speaking. So we will remove our masks while we are speaking and we want you to understand why we're doing that. Um, we do, however, ask that you keep your masks on, covering your nose and mouth for the duration of the entire panel. Uh, I told the group this morning that if you take your masks off, I will stop the panel and death stare you like I death stare my students when they cheat. Uh, don't make me do that. <laughs> I'm very tired today, so please don't make me do that. Please keep your masks on. Um, we ask that um, like we understand it's Atlanta, you're very hot. If you wanna drink some water, pull your mask down, take a sip of water, put your mask back on. Um, likewise, don't have it off for lengthy amounts of time while eating, that sort of thing. Everybody good with that? All right, thank you very much. Um, other things happening today, we have more panels in here. Um, we also have a couple big ballroom events. Uh, just after this, at 4 o'clock, we have Jurassic Park is a Terrible Zoo in the Hilton Crystal Ballroom. Um, and we have Hard Science at 7 o'clock in Hilton Grand East, so check those out if you want. Um, the room will be cleared at the end of the panel so that anyone waiting for the next panel, uh, which I believe is Teeth, can come in. So please make sure that you exit. I believe we're having people exit that way, but keep an eye out for instructions at the end. Um, we are collecting for the Dragon Con charity. Ooh, that has money in it now. Good job, everybody. Um, so if you want to put money in there for open hands, um, please do that. And I think that's everything. So uh, welcome to Teach Yourself Science. Uh, I'm Dr. Jennifer Greco. I'm an astronomer by training and now a physics teacher, and I will be moderating and jumping in on the discussion today, and I will let the rest of my panelists introduce themselves. Okay, hi. <laughs> my name is Dr. Paul Curry. Oh, now I have another mic. Oh. Here we go. My name is Dr. Paul Curry. I am a former biology and chemistry professor, and then I found this little trail of cookies and switched over to the dark side, and am now Dean of Health Professions and Culinary Arts. Um, yeah, I know, it's... A literal trail of cookies? Yeah, well, how else do you get to the dark side? And, and I'm also trained in emergency management, so I, I handle pandemics. I think the mics aren't on. Please hold for mic check. Hello, hello. 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 Oh, there we go. There we go. Test yeah? Yeah, can we do go down the line here? What's up? Test check. Check, check. Test. Test again. Yep, there we go. Hello, hello. Check one, just, yeah. Okay, yeah, all right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Savannah Miller. I am a public health professional by training. Um, I currently work for the pharmaceutical company Merck, and I'm in vaccine sales, so doing lots of vaccine-related work in their vaccine division. Um, but I do have public health training um, from Emory University, if anybody's heard of it here in Atlanta. Um, and yeah, I've taught some various things as a graduate student, um, cellular biology, human anatomy, um, undergraduate biology labs, all that good stuff. Um, but now my current teaching position is actually in yoga. So. Oh, we need to talk. 
Hey guys, I'm Bob Novella from the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast and the uh, Alpha Quadrant 6 podcast. I also co-authored our, our two books, and our second one is being released in just a few weeks, The Skeptic's Guide to the Future. So check it out. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Siobhan McCarthy. I'm a reference librarian at Montclair State University in New Jersey. Um, and uh, in that role, I liaison to the College of Science and Mathematics and I work in interlibrary loan, scholarly communication, copyright, etc. So thank you for coming. Good afternoon. Um, well, as my students call me, since my last name's a little bit long, it's Dr. Race, like running a race. That's actually my name. <laughs> but I'm Theta Daniels Race. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at uh, Louisiana State University. And i um, happy to be here again on the uh, science track. I say to people, they uh, speaking of the dark side, my friends who know me say, come on, you know, you're really a physicist, because I do work in the nanoscale. So I basically say that I am a person you know, in terms of my research, who thinks or approaches things like a physicist with the heart of a material scientist happily trapped in an EE's body. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I'm, what we're going to do, um, just so you all kind of know what this panel is going to look like, um, I'm going to give our panelists an opportunity. We'll chat a little bit about any particular resources that we recommend if you're trying to learn about the various aspects of science that we know about, any tips or tricks that we have, and then we'll open it up to all of you for questions because we want to know what you want to know about. So be thinking about your questions, and I will give the panelists an opportunity to talk about any resources you want to bring up or any tips you have for, if I want to go learn about science, what's the best way to go about that? I don't know who wants to start, but whoever, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, I'm right here, I'll go first. Um, the best advice I can give anybody who wants to learn science is step one, don't overcomplicate it. A lot of people sit there and, and look at it, and, it uh, and, and a lot of times you'll get the professors that get up there and will tell you, you have the sodium potassium pump that pumps sodium out and potassium in, and it sets up a hyperpolarization. Okay, simple explanation. Anybody here ever flushed a toilet? <laughs> That's exactly how action potentials work. Hey, okay. you just find a simple point of reference. You know, think about it. You touch that handle, absolutely nothing happens. There's a certain amount of pressure that's required to get it to go, right? There's your threshold. Once it starts, unless you're taking that toilet apart, it's an all or nothing response, okay? Once it's done, if you hit that handle again, you got, yeah, nothing's gonna happen, you've gotta wait for it to reset. So there's your, your latent periods. Keep it simple. <laughs> I, I teach distilling by teaching people how to make bourbon. <laughs> Again, keep it simple mm -hmm. and use terms that everybody understands. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I guess I'm coming in with the perspective again of that public health professional. I had actually started my graduate training at the exact same time as our best friend, COVID-19. Um, and so it was a very interesting experience, learning experience for me to actually be learning a lot about public health when everybody else suddenly also became experts about public health, right? Um, but it was also one which I actually think is very important in that, you know, public health was getting a lot more attention, both good and bad. Um, but I had a lot of questions come from friends and families, colleagues, et cetera, that might not have had a public health background but knew that I, I had a public health background. So um, that's one thing that I would say, that if you do know friends and family members that have backgrounds, expertise in different areas. I mean, that's an automatic person that you can go to to ask questions about. I had plenty of people who would send me a Facebook post that some random person made, you know, complaining to their followers about something or other related to public health, and they would send it to me and ask me questions about it. And so that's one suggestion that I had as when it comes to just um, – like verifying, I guess, information, if you know an expert. Now, obviously, that's, that's not the case for everybody. Not everybody might have a public health professional in this case, or if it's a different science area, an expert in that field. 
Um, and so I think, especially as a younger scientist, uh, we tend to use a lot of social media. Um, social media, I think, can be very good and bad for sharing science or misinformation about science. And so my advice to you all when it does come to learning about science via social media is to, of course, have, you've probably heard before, not believe everything that you read on social media. Um, but of course, there is going to be important information that can be quickly spread on, on social media. So I think it's important to remember to go that extra step of verifying the information, not always believing what might be written, but instead finding ver like verified sources. Uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Like uh, proper Credible. source? Credible, Credible sources. thank you. <laughs> Credible <laughs> sources, right? Credible sources um, on on social media, right? And so that's one thing that I've learned a lot personally during during this time as a public health professional is that it's it's a social media is a great way to 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 share really important science information with the world and be able to educate each other when it was so much hard, might have been a lot harder to do in such a quick manner before social media existed. But you do also need to be aware of taking that extra step of ensuring that you are getting this information from a credible source. Um, and there's, of course, like, you know, suggest like podcasts are great, I think. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Ologies, that podcast. That's a great podcast by Allie Ward. She's great. She brings ologists, right? Different ologists, biologists, epidemiologists, et cetera. There's one about Corvid Thanatology, which is crow funerals. Like she brings literally everybody on her podcast. And it's a great way because she's making sure she brings on credible sources to talk about a science topic. So I hope that makes sense. That's kind of just me just random spitballing here. But um, I could probably give a lot of other suggestions on social media, podcasts, things like that, that are great sources for science information itself. Can I build on that real quick? Yeah. Um, so one thing that I do a lot if I don't know about something is I'll try to find someone who knows more about it than I do and I'll say, hey, can you recommend some resources? Because as an astronomer, I'm really good at vetting astronomy resources and so I'll have a lot of people come up to me and say, hey, my friend's interested in stars, my friend's son is interested in stars, whatever, can you recommend some resources for him? And I'm always happy to do that and sort of in return, if I go to them and say, hey, I remember that you know a guy who's a doctor, I'm looking for information on X, does he have anywhere that I recommend that I go? Because then I'm letting the professionals vet the resources for me a little bit. And again, as, as she said, that requires me to know someone or know someone who knows someone, but that's another great way of, of sort of vetting the resources that are on the internet. Because as we know, anyone can put anything on the internet um, and you wanna make sure that what you're reading off online is, is credible as well. Um, yeah, a lot of great advice here. Uh, I'll, have to, I'll be echoing a lot of what they, what they, these guys have I been don't saying. I think they can hear you. You need to eat the mic for them. Okay, even more, even more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Steve always yells at me. I, he says I have bad microphone etiquette. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I have to echo a lot of what they're saying. It, it's really good advice. Vetting your sources is critical. It's absolutely critical, especially now. The, the sources out there, there's so much misinformation. It is, I mean, we're seeing the effect of misinformation and conspiracy thinking right now in, in this country and, and all over the world. It's really horrible. So vetting is, is huge. For, for the podcast, I'm often, um, every week, I'm learning something new to talk about on the, on the podcast. I go to various websites, you know, Scientific American, phys.org, um, Wondrium has great, great tutorials. Um, so it's, um, so yeah, so that's critical. Also, just learning something from, so learning science new, I find it's helpful to talk about it with your grandmother. What's that, what's that saying there? If, if you don't, if you can't understand something unless you can explain it to your grandmother. And that's really true. By verbalizing it or even blogging about it and talking about it, you can really kind of bring it all together in your head and, and, and understand it better and express it in the simplest terms. So I find that very helpful as well. Also, science is all about community. I would say, please, do not learn science alone. Don't ever do that, because that's when you start diverging, and that's how cranks are born. Uh, we get so many emails from, from cranks, and these are people that have probably from the very beginning just diverged away from the mainline consensus of whatever they're, they're studying, and you don't really know at that point you know, that you are just slowly diverging into, into crank land. Um, for example, we like one time some, somebody, a friend of mine who was not a pseudoscientist, or 
sent us a, an email talking about extolling the virtues of the aquatic ape. And it's like, wow, that's something that's clearly not, not mainstream, but he, he was suckered into it. And then you know that once you, you, know, once you read you know, some bad articles and you go to the YouTube, and then it's like game over because you just enter an ecosystem in there that, well, that sounds credible and sounds, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. But if you don't have a back and forth with people like in a scientific community online or with some friends that are actual like PhDs and, and know their stuff, if you don't have that feedback back and forth to make sure that you, to bring you back onto into the main line, I'll say, or the, or the consensus, you can just veer away and, be a, and, be a, and turn into a crank. So you really make it a community effort. Find some great resources online or people that you can call. Like for the podcast I talked to, I have a physicist friend, an astronomer friend, and if something's especially you know, cutting edge and difficult and hard to believe, they will often bring me back and say, no, Bob, this is interesting, but it's so unlikely that you really need to stress that. So I, I make a point to stress it on the podcast that this is fascinating and interesting, and maybe it's true, but the sigma level is only at one. So this is not anything that you need to be com that, that anyone's confident about yet. So you got to put it in, into perspective. So that's that's my three cents. Okay. Can I so, add something real quick on the credibility and vetting your sources? One of the things that I always find very important to do is to look down and see who funded the research because mm. it'll be very credible. And I'll cite a very specific example. In the early days of the Atkins Foundation, they came up with a nice study that showed that the Atkins diet was safe when compared to a starvation diet. <laughs> And I'm not making that one up. It is legit, published, peer-reviewed, funded by Atkins. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm going to uh, give a kind of a two-pronged elevator speech here. Uh, the first, I'll kind of add in my couple cents about um, credibility. So um, when I tell people that I'm a librarian, of course, I get the, oh, you must have loved to read, or I loved going to the library as a kid. And I was like, no, that's not really what we do in academia. Um, but what we, what we do do is... Um, so yeah, that's not what we do in academia, like reading books and stuff, uh, although we do do some of that. Um, but what our primary role is teaching information literacy. So um, we spend a lot of time uh, talking, especially to um, you know, incoming students, um, you know, freshmen, sophomores, and giving them the basics of how to evaluate their sources. So there is something that we use a lot called the crap test. Um, and I usually introduce this to the students by saying um, librarians are very, very amused by acronyms. Um, but what it stands for is uh, currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. So these are kind of the steps that you would go through to evaluate whatever the information is that you're looking at. So is it current, you know, is it, or is it an article that's, you know, 10 years old? Relevance, you know, authority, who wrote the article? Um, and what's the purpose of the article? Is it marketing something, or is it actually there to, to educate? Um, so that is uh, something, especially again, when you get to social media, there are good social media accounts for um, you know sharing uh, academic knowledge, and there are also shady ones of like you know those. Uh, uh, what are they like the uber facts is like my personal nightmare and it's just like i would go up be on twitter and just report 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 <laughs> you know um so it was uh you know oof. but anyway uh so my second uh pronged um uh, prong of the elevator speech here um is that uh, as a librarian uh, who's worked in public libraries and who's worked in a public university um i don't think that the average member of the public uh understands how much information you have access to um so one of the things that i would um when i was telling people that i was going to be on this panel one of the things that i would say like oh yeah my main um like you know talking point of this panel is going to be how to annoy your public librarians into getting you academic information um and uh, so Having worked in um, an interlibrary loan department, um, I would frequently get asked by you know members of the public who would contact us by email saying you know oh can you send me this article or can you you know mail me this book or something or can I come in and, and borrow this book from you, and many times my answer would be no but. Um, you know, I can explain to you exactly how to phrase your question to your local public librarian so that we can do this because, um, you know, of course there are things like Sci-Hub out there and I can has PDF and lots of other, you know, places to, uh, to get information. Um, but being the copyright person on my campus, uh, I often uh, end up in a like do as I say, not as I do situation. Um, so uh, there are many legal 
way or many ways to legally access peer-reviewed information, um, going beyond just the preprint servers that are out there. Um, and it is very important to make use of the resources that you have available to you because um, you probably don't realize that your local public universities are open to the public um, as a condition of their state funding. So often, even if you can't access their databases from home, you can go onto campus and download nearly anything you want. Um, so uh, if anybody has uh, specific questions about how to do that sort of thing, I will give you all the details. So uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, being on the end, I will say that a lot of what was in my head has already been said, so I won't <laughs> repeat. But that being said, I, I will tell you um, maybe in a, in a somewhat uh, a little bit different way. So what about, we've talked a lot about, you know, you can access certain things social media wise, you can do this and that online. What if you don't have access to the internet? That actually still exists, right? Um, there's parts of the country, not, not so much necessarily exactly where I am, but some uh, people that say when our oldest was in high school, there was a kid, he, we, he was in a very good, you know, high school city, but when he went home, he had a commute of a couple hours to a farm and there was not good, you know, internet access there, what do you do there? What do you do when there's a hurricane <laughs> and everything's out and you need to know something? So what has been said about building communities, building relationships, ways you get in touch with people, bugging your librarian, I'm gonna bug her even after this is over probably, um, and, and, and doing all that is important. But likewise, one of the things that you can look at doing, well, actually was kind of said is if you can physically get to certain places. I do kind of a poll in my courses, well my course, because I'm on the dark side too, it's administration and research, but I, I, I do a poll of how many of y'all, you know, engineering, electrical engineering and other students, STEM students, have actually physically gone to the library. And you'd be surprised lots of times, that sometimes it's a n good number, sometimes it's hardly anybody, because you can do this, right? And particularly on campus and access everything. So sometimes physically going and getting to know cool people like these is a big help. And I tell, I tell even um, uh, my graduate students and particularly younger students coming in, I guess I'm sort of in the student and the teacher mode right now. But that being said, I tell them, look, everybody that's got those three letters behind PhD in their names got a little bit of an ego. Just, just little, got a little something, right? So if you want some help from someone that, again, sometimes you don't know and you don't know you don't know, but you gotta start somewhere. If you want some help from someone that you think is credible, um, and maybe other ways you've checked that, if you go on their webpage, say it's a university professor, and you can meet some jerks, y'all know, you know, some you know, times, it, but what's the worst they're gonna do, right? The worst they can say is no. So if that's the worst you're gonna get, big deal. But you go and look, at, look this person up, and you can say something like the following. Dr. Smith, um, I, you know, I wanted to ask you about such and such. I really don't know about, you know, insert X. But I was looking at um, some of your publications. I'm not an expert, but I was really fascinated by such and such. You have got their attention, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Just a little ego poke. You don't have to understand what it's all about. You, and also, you know, don't be a phony, be honest, and just say, I don't know all this, but I did notice you've done work in such and such. I don't care if that paper's on there 50 years old. You have now separated yourself from the herd, particularly if, if you're a student, um, whereby it's like, oh, well they, they know something about me as opposed to sometimes when I get spam emails, like, you know, wanna be in your research group and it says, dear sir. Well, automatically I'm like, I'm, you know, you didn't even look at the picture, man, I guess, come on, kinda, I'm a girl, you can kinda tell. So I know that's not, you know, uh, credible, right, so to speak. But what I'm saying is, and this is coming from a person who tests like probably 95% plus introvert on the old Myers-Briggs scale, right? Go and make yourself, bring a wingman if you need to or whatever, and meet some people that, whether it's at your public library, particularly your university library and so forth, maybe something you have checked out on YouTube or, or some of the social media and you wanna check is right. See if you can get with a physical person and build some sort of, you know, not to say necessarily relationship in detail, but at least some sort of interaction. So the next time they see you, you can say, oh, I, you remember we talked less, you know, that kind of thing. Just that human encounter um, beyond the computer is sometimes just a lifesaver. And, and most of all, I'm very, very big on checking the source behind the source behind the source. 
to the extent, and the last thing I'll say, when our youngest was a, a little kid, he overheard another kid talking about looking something up on Wikipedia. Now, years ago, y'all know Wikipedia wasn't quite always you know, accurate. And I was so proud when I heard my young son at probably five or six say, Wikipedia is evil. And I, I didn't tell him that. I didn't tell him that, but I did tell him to be careful when you check. In fact, somebody recently told me, I've got a Wikipedia page. I did not make it. I don't know. You're not allowed to. Yeah, yeah somebody, <laughs> some of it, a couple of things in there could use a little tweaking, but that being said, jump out of your shell as best you can, as I try to do as well, and, and talk to some folks, even here at DragonCon. Yes, along the way you may meet some, you know, you know, out there, but you you do enough that you can start to maybe get together with some sources and places and people that you have you feel you can rely upon as having some quality uh, information. So I just want to add on to uh, two things. Sorry, can I interrupt? I need to remind the audience that if everyone doesn't keep their masks over their nose and mouth, I'm not going to be able to continue the panel. Thank you. So I just wanted to add um, two things to uh, what Theta said. Um, first, on um, you know how getting uh, in touch with the humans. So a librarian's going to be your personal navigators. Um, you know we're very used to reaching out to researchers um, and just you know bas basically doing that, just navigating kind of these somewhat confusing landscapes on your behalf. Um, if you you know feel um, if you feel intimidated by reaching out directly to a researcher, um, I mean, sometimes you know a lot of researchers get you know tons of emails, some with you know crazy theories, some with questions, and it's just it's not possible to respond to everybody sometimes. Um, but sometimes you know we can you know go a little bit deeper and try to find you know contact information for maybe a press contact at their university or department secretary or something like that. This is stuff that we that we do, so that is an option as well if you don't want to reach out directly to the researcher. Um, the second thing that I'll uh, just comment on. Um, is the digital divide. It is very, very real. Um, so, you know, we here in this room at Con, um, and, you know, many of us have advanced degrees in this room, we may not, you know, remember that there are students out there who are relying on dial-up internet access um, in part. And, uh, yeah, students and elderly folks, and just you know, folks who don't have um, broadband accessible in their communities. Just, I mean, it's not maybe a matter of whether or not they can afford it. You know, the lines just may not exist there, or there may not be a satellite option there. Um, so, uh, you know, that is something to remember, especially um, when a lot of universities and high schools and, and other schools went virtual during COVID-19. I mean, you know, some students didn't have access to fast enough bandwidth to be able to do video conferences and some teachers were requiring that you be on video in order to in, in order to participate in the class in order to get credit for the class um, so this is something that you have to be really really conscious of whenever you're you're working with large populations you cannot make the assumption that everybody is technologically literate or digitally literate or has access to um, high-speed technology or access to technology in general I mean, I was going to add things, but actually that was an excellent, excellent amount of information that just went out. Uh, one thing um, that I always recommend um, is to kind of look at what's available in the city where you live. So like, for example, um, where I live, we have a planetarium and we have a lot of events for the public where we teach about astronomy or the university runs a lecture series where they bring in people to give talks on weekends to talk about various things. and so. Take a look at what's in your local area. Does your library have a lecture series? Does your university have resources? Is there a science museum that holds events? And things like that. Places like that are great places to both learn things and meet people who know more stuff. So like I used to run the public observing at a, the small observatory where I did my PhD. I'd have parents come up to me and say, hey, my daughter's really interested in astronomy and I don't know what to do. And I'd talk to them, and I'd connect them with resources, and I'd give them my email or the emails of people who could help them. And that's a great way, like, if you need information on something um, and you don't know an expert, to meet an expert. Uh, and I've had great luck with that on both sides as well. Uh, do I have a mic runner for this, or am I running the mic <laughs> for Q&A? All right, I have a wireless mic. I will run this mic around the room. Raise your hand if you have questions. And I will go from one end of the room to the other and moderate as I walk. It'll be great. My question kind of jumps off your question, which is I have become a homeschooler <laughs> and trying to find really good science for 11 and 
nine and five, we spent a lot of time looking at more vetting your science that you see, but I really was trying to branch out and find more resources. So I don't know if anybody had any suggestions on that. So uh, off the bat, uh, I can't speak enough about this particular site. It's one of the kind of original STEM sites on the internet, the Khan Academy is absolutely wonderful place to start. Um, it's a, spelled with a K. Yeah. Like we're at the con. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they have spelled K H A N. Yeah. They have both uh, their site on YouTube as well as their own hosted site. It's a very good place to kind of start there. Um, I will also say uh, the Chicago Public School System has a lot of very good resources available for parents to use, particularly for younger kids uh, and helping getting them ready for uh, starting first grade So and, and helping them uh, work through kindergarten. So I, I do have to mention that particular site. Okay, um, so uh, the specific term that you want to Google is open education resources and then whatever topic is uh, that you want to uh, want to teach about. So I have a little bit more experience at this at the college level, of course, um, but uh, there are many sites out there. So open education resources are um, usually uh, Creative Commons licensed materials, and they can be textbooks um, at all different levels. They can be professional development textbooks. They can be um, elementary K-12 textbooks. Um, they can be regular, you know, introduction to astronomy, introduction to physics, whatever textbooks. Um, but there are uh, also teaching materials out there. So there will be activities, lesson plans, PowerPoints, and so on. Um, so if you uh, look at some of the sites, uh, Merlot, uh, spelled like the wine, um, is one of the one of the more popular ones. It's a directory. Uh, OER Commons uh, is another uh, website to take a look at. Many of them will have filters that you can narrow it down by grade level. Um, so that will be extremely useful. And that is also a very good place to get free textbooks if anybody else wants to just read a textbook for fun uh, because I know that there are many of you in here. So. Um, I'll add, as a first year teacher, uh, I am living on the website Teachers Pay Teachers, um, which is a great site um, and also has a lot of free things, uh, contrary to the name. You can buy things, but it also has a lot of free things. There's a lot of great resources there. Uh, for physics in particular, I recommend a website called uh, the Physics Classroom. Um, and there's also a website, if you look up PHET, and I honestly forget what it stands for, there's a great website with a lot of interactive online physics demos that I recommend uh, to people as well. That one's really fun. Uh, am I running mics or are you running mics? What's I going on with. Mic. Okay. <laughs> but it's your mic. But it's my mic. Okay, then I'll run the mic. Uh, <laughs> other questions? <laughs> So uh, when I was growing up and uh, books were written on papyrus, <laughs> I, uh, I read most of Isaac Asimov's collections of, of essays. And generally there were science essays, but I mean, learned about biology, chemistry, history, astronomy, physics. And so for someone who would rather read than watch a six episode miniseries and just get kind of a broad spectrum, who are the authors nowadays? I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson comes to mind, but he's, he seems to be more focused on astronomy. Is there anyone who writes, you know, generally comprehensible uh, essays on, on different topics than science? And if you could please repeat the question so that if anyone's hard of hearing, they can read your list. Uh, the question was, um, are there any authors you recommend who write um, comprehensible essays on things in science? I feel like physics, astronomy, and quantum mechanics, Sean Carroll is amazing. Sean Carroll is amazing. A little dense. You might need to listen to it three times, but <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. Let's see what's there. I have book recommendations, but not necessarily essays. I don't know if that's as you for at least for, for books. Um, David Quammen, he's, he's 
written several books. They're a bit more dramatized, I guess, but they are about, for example, Spillover um, is about, I'm blanking on which disease it was, um, but he very much, he takes diseases and basically explains how that outbreak, epidemic, et cetera, came to be, where it originated from, how it how it occurred, the actors involved. Um, so he kind of turns it into a story, which makes it a lot more engaging rather than just reading a science article with a bunch of big words that not necessarily everybody understands, right, science jargon. Him and, um, I'm forgetting, the guy who wrote The Hot Zone, somebody might. Oh, yeah. Yes. Richard Preston. He also has, gr again, it's going to be a bit more dramatized, but I I think his writing is great because, again, he takes, yes, he has the, I think he's, like, written The Magic Bullet. Um, there's a couple other ones he's written, but he's, again, he's taken different diseases and um, turned them more into stories, but still accurate information about each one. Uh, Quammen, David Quammen, Q-U-A-M-M-E-N, I think it is. Hi, so um, is that good? Yeah. Okay, so my question is, uh, I, I'm a recovering geologist from, I've been out of the field for like almost 20 years, so I didn't stay in it long, and I miss it terribly, so uh, just that, not the work. Um, so my question, <laughs> government work, you know. Um, so my question is, is there a periodical or a, a podcast specifically about earth sciences that you guys enjoy? Or because uh, everything is is professional journals and white papers, and those are very dull. Um, so I can't speak to um, a, a podcast specifically, but um, the American Geophysical Union has tons of newsletters that you can sign up for, um, and a lot of their um, they they do, and especially this is a be another benefit of kind of benefit of the COVID uh, situation, um, but a lot of uh, professional talks are being um, posted on YouTube now, which you can probably download um, download the, the uh, audio from somehow, um, or they might, I believe that AGU also has a podcast. Um, I can't think of the, the title of it right now. Um, but looking at professional associations, normally um, what you'll find, uh, it, the, the publicly available stuff is more uh, written at a colloquial level. Um, so you don't have to listen to the, the super dry, you know, science, which is very interesting, but it's not really what you want to listen to if you're driving to work one day. Um, so th that material does exist. So I would look at the professional associations. Um, AG, uh, like I said, AGU has a, a lot of that. Um, and I know that they have put a lot of conference keynotes um, for like the, the annual meetings or the biannual meetings. Um, they've put those up on YouTube or have audio recordings of them. So that might be something to take a look at. George George Rob question, has a geologic. The question was about uh, geology resources, in case anyone didn't get it. George Rob has a geologic podcast. It has nothing to do with geology, but it's really funny, so I recommend that, George just for fun. Yeah. George Rob, H R A B. Hello. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, so. Uh, something that I really like to do, because I'm also a reader, um, I buy used books off of thrift books, looking at, you know, the source, you know, where they came from, um, and I will reread over and over again, because I learn something new every time, especially the more that I understand something, um, and I try to keep myself curious because I feel like curiosity is the most important thing when it comes to teaching yourself. How do you guys keep yourself curious and like actively wanting to find more information, even if sometimes you kind of don't feel like it? <laughs> um, so the question was, how do you keep yourselves curious and actively wanting to find more information? Okay. Just go ahead and talk. I'm just, I was, <laughs> I was asked that I repeat the question with my mask off after the audience member asks it. So I'm going to do that. If you have trouble and you need to read lips, look at me and I'll repeat it with my mask off and then everyone can talk as they do it. I think I can address that um, in the sense that, well, as again, as, as one of our kids said, I, I started doing what I do before fire you know, was discovered. <laughs> Thank you, son. Anyway, I love him dearly. But one thing that happens, I guess I would call it even sort of curiosity malaise a bit. Um, I, like, honestly, if I sit on any, any given time, I try not to 
verbalize it to myself, but I'm tired, y'all. So, I mean, you know, you get enough, few gray hairs, and you've been doing certain things a while. But one thing I find is if you are, uh, and in a way this is a bit cheating because I'm at a, a university, right? But if you're around people or, or places that challenge you and kind of get your juices going again, because sometimes you, you know, like I do what I do, I've been doing nanomaterials, uh, but then once in a while just like something gets me. And honestly, part of it for me, um, I don't know if anybody else has felt this way and I, you know, not ageism here, but to be perfectly frank, um, I think the older I've gotten in a way, the less patient I am. So like if I read a book, if it's not, say a fiction book particularly, and I, I got back to finally reading fiction, right? But if, if it's not like getting me going in the first, I, I give it like a chapter tops, maybe I, like I'm done, you know, and I got other stuff to do. So you, you have to find what sort of challenges you. In, in one sense, I look at even our, our I'm gonna use the kids here as an example, our oldest son, and our daughter-in-law are both computer science folks. And for the longest time, right, I was like one of the two techies in the household. I know all this stuff. But now, as you want, your children surpass you. So when our oldest talks to me, anybody old enough to remember Charlie Brown on TV when the parents would go walk, 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 walk? <laughs> he may as well be going walk, 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 tree. Walk, 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 computer. Walk, 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 and what? You know? So, <laughs> so sometimes you have to find what... It, in, and that, like I said, gets you going, challenges you, and, and also maybe in a way a little bit intimidates intimidate you, not in a bad way, but in the sense that another thing that I felt besides tired at times was like, wow, I should know this. I should know that. Why don't I know this? Oh, are things passing me by? What's happening? I used to know, and now there's more. I seem, well, there's always been more you don't know than you do know but maybe you start to recognize it more as you, you know, maybe focus in or, or, or times in your career. So I find that I, whether it's something on TV, something I read, somebody I bumped into here, like your question, whatever, reminds me, you know, things, so many things I've even learned just on the panel right now. I'm, I'm actually taking notes. Um, I, I need some paper, yes. but I'm on a napkin here. Um, but I know how to I'll reach them again. Just things to, to where, oh, where is that? Because if you start to feel, as I have, felt in, in um, the last few years of, wait a minute, there's so many more things, am I going to catch up, right? Or, or do I know enough, why don't I know this? When it's like, everybody, oh, everybody knows that. That To me, that's really an arrogant thing to say. It's not, but you know, people, everybody knows that. Well, no, everybody doesn't know that, right? Your, your, your interests or your specialty or what you do or what you do, and there's things you don't know. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of saying there's no dumb questions, especially when you're paying money to get an answer. <laughs> right, um, and one other place is that I throw out there. I don't know how people feel about this, but lately it's a non-STEM thing I'm looking into out of interest. But I've gotten on Coursera now, and there's a lot of free stuff on there. If you don't want to invest, you know, if you do find it interesting enough, you want to invest in it, fine. But um, so there's there's things out there that their job is to make money teaching the subject matter, but they also have a lot of free introductory things, and if that might pique your curiosity. I just see questions. It's okay to know a little about a lot. You don't have to know a, you don't have to know a Your lot about a lot. Friend. It's okay to know a little about a lot. Uh, can I make a comment for the audience, which is after the person who asks the question hands the mic back to me, can the people who still have questions like stick their hands up halfway so that I can figure out who has questions uh, and know where to go? So I'm gonna go this side of the room next. It, you guys can keep talking. I just needed to know who had questions. Yeah. This is in reference to uh, um, misinformation uh, because sometimes I struggle with like what sources to actually believe and where to get my information from. So what do you blatantly just say like, this is rubbish, I won't even go there and respect it, whether it's social media, radio, print, do you just say like, okay, I'm not even gonna go there. So. The question about um, finding credible sources and if there's anything that we would recommend you not look at. So I actually tend to go, and this is gonna be somewhat heretical to, to some people, but I tend to take the legend method with it in that there's probably a shred of truth in a lot of this misinformation. Um, and so it's one of those, you just kinda of gotta go deeper and start tracing back the sources. For example, the ivermectin COVID thing. Okay. Yeah. 
it actually will reduce your risk of getting COVID. It was written by several people in developing countries. Uh, they are MD, PhDs. It is vetted research. It is peer reviewed. And it was groups of people that knew for them, the vaccine was years away, not months. And they were just trying to come up with anything they could to help their population. Is it as good as a vaccine? No, but it's not necessarily misinformation to say that ivermectin won't reduce your chance of getting it. Doesn't reduce it a lot, but, and, but you have to start digging on those papers. And yeah, you dig on the papers, you start looking at the authors and where they're from, and you put two and two together. Um, and that's kind of my advice on misinformation is, while at face value, the source may be less than credible, dig deeper and see where they got their information and then keep backtracking until you find, because chances are there really is a peer reviewed paper back there that started it. Now, some of them are uh, completely bogus. You know, uh, uh, somebody took a line out of a paper completely out of context and you get uh, farts make you smarter. So. Yeah, so it's, um, to add on to that, it's a major game of telephone um, at that point. So um, going back to evaluating information, so a lot of times what I'll do with um, my introduction to like, you know, writing composition students um, is, you know, okay, what would you do when you're starting a research paper? Um, and then somebody says, go to the library, and I'm like, you're lying, I know that you're gonna go Google it or whatever. Um, so I wait for somebody <laughs> to say, oh, we go to Google or look it up on the internet, go to Wikipedia. Um, and then I take them through the steps. I say, okay, now we're looking at this article, which is probably not the greatest source ever. It might not be necessarily misinformation, but it's definitely not, you know, it doesn't have its cited sources on it. Um, and I, you know, kind of recommend to them, you wanna at least go another, like two or three sources deep to find out where that information is coming from. So um, if, if your uh, article that you're looking at doesn't have an author, red flag immediately. Um, if it does have an author, you wanna Google the name of that author to find out what their credentials are. And you wanna go at least two or three steps deep in order to find out where that information is coming from. If you need to go beyond two or three steps to find something credible, whether it's a peer reviewed paper, whether it's um, somebody's faculty webpage on a, on a university site, whether it's a press release, um, then chances are it's not really a source that you want to use to, to kind of boost your uh, argument on something. I'll add as well, if you find the original paper, because often if you read a popular article, it's, you know, it's, they interviewed the scientists or they read the paper and it's their take on the, the original research. Don't be afraid of it if you, could, if you find it. If you find it or paid for it or whatever, don't be afraid of it. A lot of it is, is so technical it's mind numbing, but if you read the abstract and the conclusion, it's, it's often in plain language and, or at least more understandable language than, than the, the body of the research. And you could also have some good takeaways from just reading just the, those little bits of the original paper. It's always better to go to there than secondary or tertiary sources. Um, I, I don't know if it's on, I can't hear. Uh, first of all, I want to say uh, librarians rule. Um, and <laughs> part of that, this isn't so much about teaching. Um, I teach, uh, I'm a Nova STEM mentor for BSA, and I find that I can get the youth really excited about I STEM. can't hear you, sorry. And, and, okay, and can you say what that acronym, BSA for? All BS, BSA, Boy Scouts of America. Oh, oh, sorry, okay. So I'm a STEM uh, mentor, and I can get the kids really excited about learning STEM. But I've recently discovered that the upstream folk don't seem to really appreciate the program that they even have. And I was hoping maybe you had some advice on how to, I guess, energize, say, parents and even senior management to get on board with the STEM, uh, STEM program that you're trying to like really push, push forward. Question is about getting parents uh, and other sort of management authority figures excited about STEM programs for kids. Um, oh, you want to oh. I, I don't work a lot with parents, quite honestly, right, in the university level, because it's um, my, my dear, phenomenal parents who are retired 42 years each, New Orleans public school system did. Uh, my mother elementary school, all those years, no air conditioning, believe it or not, in uh, New Orleans, she's a saint and my dad, high school math teacher and guidance counselor. So I've seen them um, 
deal with parents and and particularly um, they were working with kids in you know you name it the urban inner city you know the, the tough places and schools where maybe mom or dad's working two and three jobs or you know uncle or grandfather's taking care of them but you know the parents in prison or somebody's on drugs and there's all these other things going on it's not that you know maybe they don't want to be interested but life is just in a bad place um, one thing that I saw my mom do over the years is she sort of spoke the language, if you will, of the person with whom she was dealing. So, for example, if she's dealing with someone like yourself, you know, she's speaking, you know, uh, about things, you know, uh, things that that you would relate to. Oh, it's wonderful you're dealing with Boy Scouts of America, these organizations. If she's dealing with somebody who's like mom or dad just came out of the pen, right? Then she's like, hey, I know it's it's tough. You're trying to get yourself together. And, and saying things that that person relates to, but I'm, I'm a tiny bit surprised, not overly surprised, but a tiny bit surprised at what you're saying. The only thing that I would say is, is try to find, if you can, or talk, as you talk to the kids, learn what it is their parents relate to, and if there's anything that's, that you can put on the track of what you're doing to say, like I think someone, the gentleman said earlier down there, make it relatable as in, well, you know, science is good, but why is science good? Well, you know, when that food burned in the kitchen, or when this happened, or when there was that disaster, things that people would pay attention to on a very, you know, sort of heartfelt level. You know, if New Orleans, if you talked about Katrina, everybody's got a story, so, and there's, got, and there's definitely science, you know, in, in everything, but certainly that you can bring in in that and say, you know, if you know, blah, 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 blah. So you, you try to find, so to speak, people where they live, um, as best you can, and if that's not something you can relate to, because um, I'm, you know, I'm grateful, but I've never had to relate to like a relative being in jail or whatever, right? Nothing like that. Just a middle class kid here. But that being said, you know, it's like has been said, the friend of a friend, the person of the person, because um, you have the resources, right? And lots of times, folks, it's not that they may not be interested sometimes because they don't have the resources. Other times, just life has taken them in a way, or their background is such a way, where it's like you say, you don't know, and you don't know you don't know. It's not that they're trying to be obtuse about it, they just don't have that sense of, of why. So you've got to find a person's why, and then hopefully that would help from there. And other organizations they might believe in. Maybe they might, for whatever reason, not look as highly on one organization or another, find what might be, again, their thing. So it's the old corner, it's like the thing I tell people all the time, when you take a group photo, right, who do you look for first? What do you look at first? Yourself. yourself, right? So everybody's most interested in themselves, right? So find out what, take yourself in as best you can into them or and be that person as best as you can and then go from there. And I'm sorry, I know the gentleman here and folks have had their hands up, so I'll I want to jump on this because I run a high school STEM program um, and kind of along the lines of what you were saying, um, what I do is I focus on the things that are important to the parents. So I teach at a college prep school. They're interested in what's going to get their daughters into college and get them good jobs. And so I say, okay, STEM builds the following skills and these skills are used for um, in the following careers. And then um, I'm fortunate that the program that I just inherited has been around long enough that I have alumni and I can ask the alumni and say, okay, in what ways did studying STEM help you when you went on to college or you went on to whatever career you're doing? And then I have data where they can say, you know, I had a girl come back to me and say, well, because of STEM, I was the only one in my college engineering class who knew how to use a hammer. Mm -hmm. Out of all the guys in my engineering class, I'm the only one who knew how to use a hammer. And like <laughs> those, if your programs existed long enough that you have alumni who have stories like that, those are so powerful because it's firsthand evidence of what it is that you're trying to say. And parents love if you can back up what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I have um, a question back here. I'm gonna One, one other away. thing I want to add on this too is part of the problem that you run into is the illusion that's been created by the STEM fields themselves, which is uh, it's very difficult. You have to be genius level intelligence to get into it. I mean, you've all heard the, the phrase, it's not rocket science, mm -hmm. okay? Rocket science is just blowing things up for the most part. <laughs> you know, Newtonian physics, it's common sense. They just put in formulas for it. You know, it's, it's really dispelling that it's not as complicated as it looks. You've just got to break it down into terms that people understand. Um, and then the administrator side of me always points out the top earning fields are STEM fields. Mm -hmm. 
and that usually gets parents. Yeah. Uh, so you guys have given a ton of great information already. Um, we're gonna eat it really, I gotta go into it. Okay, you give me a ton of information already. Um, well, let's say you, you've already kind of found your oasis of information. It's peer reviewed, it's reliable. Um, what are methods that each of you have used throughout your time in science to filter that to answer questions that you're curious about? YouTube videos. Can no, no, no. And, and can someone on the panel repeat the question, please? Because they yeah, can see you. Yeah, so the, the question is, um, we found our oasis of information. How do we turn that into something relatable that make it verifying that I'm getting it exactly right? And for me, it is really start with YouTube videos. For example, um, there's one called Redneck Carnival Ride. Right? Uh, it is basically a girl that is uh, attached to two bungee cords. They pull her back with a four-wheeler and let go. Wow. Right? So it is a great example of kinetic energy transitioning to potential energy and back and forth. <laughs> and you know, you, you start, you, that's really kind of where I start is I'll take a video and go, how can I use this to explain a science concept? No, she, she, it, she does bounce back and forth. She doesn't get thrown completely. Uh, one of the best ones, by the way, look up liquid mountaineering. This is a great video to uh, practice your observational skills and see if you can find out what the trick is and why that video was created. Liquid mountaineering. Now I want to go home and do that. Um, <laughs> And, and maybe this is the, in, the STEM teacher in me coming out, but um, I love hands-on activities and demos. Nothing makes something more relatable than if, especially with astronomy, like I can explain black holes to you by having you spin marbles around in a piece of fabric. Then like I've had like four-year-olds understand a black hole by doing that. And so the more hands-on and interactive you can make it, the more relatable it is. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. I've seen a hand up in the front. Uh, uh, yeah, I am seeing more and more sort of anti-scientific uh, bent coming into our society and creeping into the state and using that as policy. One, are you seeing that? And two, is it having an effect on the students that are coming to you? Uh, as, yeah, the resident public health person up here, yes. <laughs> um, I did a lot of policy research in addition to, like, clinical stuff um, in my training. Um, and unfortunately, at least here in the United States, again, this is more so of my opinion, we have a government set up where those who are able to create and enforce policies that impact human health do not ever have to have any human health training at all. Um, and that's something that us public health professionals are trying to, at least some of us are trying to fix, where we um, are trying to become more involved in politics and policy making in general. You know, we do have a lot of health policy researchers, right? But when it comes to health policy, research um, as public health people we inform but there's no guarantee that those who actually implement the policy are going to actually do what we informed them about right um, and so that's where it also becomes important for all of you too because you all have the right and decision to choose your policymakers, right um, and so that's where I think it's important to keep this in mind in that uh, not everybody who is a poli who makes policy, I'm not trying to, you know, <laughs> be mean about policy makers. It's just knowing that they are decision makers, but they're not necessarily experts on the topic they're making a policy on, right? Um, and so that, yeah, so the, the, the short answer is yes, we, we are seeing that. Um, but I think it's not all bad. I hate to create like a doomsday <laughs> scenario or something like that right now because, um, I mean, you all are here t trying to learn about how to learn more about science, right? And become more informed and more educated yourselves. So I commend you all on doing that. Like, congrats on doing that for yourselves. Um, and, you know, take it out of this room. Like, whatever you might learn today, share it with your friends, your families, things like that, so that they also can be more informed and, and take it to 
action, right? It's it's one thing to sit and learn, but another thing to, to turn it into action. And that goes for anybody, whether you're a policymaker, a citizen, a researcher like myself. So that's kind of what I have to say on that. I, 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 I hate to cut short a discussion, but we are at time. I'm very sorry. Um, I would uh, thank all the panelists and thank all of you for asking such great questions. I'm sorry I have to cut the discussion short, but it is 3.30, and I know a lot of us have panels after this. Um, Rate the panel. So give everyone a hand, and then I have a couple quick announcements. Um, so a couple quick announcements. A reminder that if you want to hang out with Science Track more today, we have Jurassic Park is a Terrible Zoo at 4 in the Crystal Ballroom. And next and hard science in Hilton Grand East tonight. Also, on Monday, we have a panel called Calculations We're Sad We're Doing, and we're asking you to solicitate things you would like to know. So maybe it's what would happen if you jumped into a swimming pool full of jello, or how many ferrets does it take to circle the earth? I don't know. Whatever you've always wanted to know that you would love to watch a panel of scientists, including me, calculate, on Monday afternoon, please write on these index cards and put in that box over there and then come back on Monday and watch us do math. Um, and don't forget to donate for the DragonCon charity and please rate us in the DragonCon app. Did I forget anything? All right. Uh...